my um, uh, disclosure slide. You can read. I give you 10 seconds to read it. <clears throat> this is my background. As I said, I was raised and born in Europe and uh, raised in France, and I did my medical school in Grenoble, Bordeaux, and then I moved to the U.S., went back to France, went back to the U.S., and then to Canada. So, and I will stay in Canada. Do we have many people in Canada, from Canada here in the room? Can you raise your hands? Okay. So for those who are not from Canada, <clears throat> here in French, we say, what do we do in Montreal during winter time? Because there are a lot of people who are not from Montreal and who are not from Canada who are wondering what we do during winter time. We still do a lot of things in Canada and in Montreal when it snows. So we have minus, even at minus 30 degrees Celsius, we go out and we have lots of activities. Uh, the best activity is this one, try to find your car outside when there is a lot of snow. And that's what we like to do at 5 a.m. in the morning. And when it's too much snow, we walk. So, as Patricia said, it's um, interesting uh, that for many years we had developed monitors for the depth of anesthesia, the hypnosis. We had developed monitors for muscle relaxation. But we didn't have good monitors for analgesia or nociception, so we were still trying to guess whether the patient body uh, was feeling nociception uh, under anesthesia, and so there was a need of uh, new monitors. Without these monitors, we had clinical signs that you all know of, uh, heart rate, blood pressure are the two main clinical signs that we use, and there are other clinical signs that we don't want to see in our patients. But most of the time, we use heart rate as a surrogate uh, to tell us whether the patient feels nociception or feels pain, if we, can, we cannot say pain, but feels nociception under general anesthesia. So we needed to move forward and find something a little bit better. Why do we need to monitor nociception during surgery? <clears throat> there are two reasons, two simple reasons. If we do not give enough analgesia during the surgery, you will let your nervous system sensitize. Pain sensitization is the first step to pain chronicization, as Martin Angst was explaining. So, um, and if you give too much of analgesia, as we saw this morning, too much opioids means also more pain sensitization and more risk of developing acute and chronic pain after surgery. So this is a slide summarizing this. Sensitization, if you let your central nervous system sensitize, then you will lead to persistent post-surgical pain. We have just written a big review in anesthesiology in September 2018, talking about what we can do in anesthesia to prevent the development of persistent post-surgical pain. And we know that high doses of opioids are responsible for more sensitization and a, a higher risk of developing chronic pain. And surgical trauma and lack of analgesia will also lead to sensitization and a higher risk of developing chronic pain. So we have many things to do in anesthesia to try to decrease the sensitization. <clears throat> Martin Engst was talking about opioid induced hypersensitivity or hyperalgesia. These meta-analyses showed that out of uh, 27 studies over the last 15 years, 1,500 patients, uh, all types of opioids, but mostly remifentanil, we could see this uh, opioid induced hypersensitivity. <clears throat> if you give too much of opioids, these meta-analyses showed that there is more pain one for 24 hours after surgery, and there, are, there is more morphine consumption in PACU after the surgery. Uh, so problem is that it does not always exist, whether it is tolerance, whether it is hyperalgesia. Martin Hanks explained that to us this morning. If you give low dose, you don't see it. If you give high dose, you might see it. Uh, and there are still controversies on that between the meta-analysis from 2014, the two of them, uh, still a little bit of, of uh, controversy, and they say that they do not believe that it reaches a level of clinical uh, significance if you use small dose of opioids. So we need to monitor what we do intraoperatively, and we need to monitor how we give opioids. If we want to go to opioid-free anesthesia, if we want to go to opioid low-dose anesthesia, we need to monitor the nociception. These are two review articles. This one is in press. You can find it online. It's just out now. <clears throat> and this one is from 2013. 
I circled the different monitors that exist. We do not have time this morning to go through all the monitors that are on the market right now worldwide, in Europe, North America, Asia, or whatever. But we are going to have a very close or rapid look at what exists. The pupil diameter, as you can see here, the pupil dilate. If you have pain, you will see some dilation, and then it goes down again. Uh, but there are two devices. This one is the one available in the US, and this one is the one available in uh, Europe. So we can measure the pupil diameter to, as a surrogate of nociception felt by the patient under general anesthesia. Some people developed an, a monitor in Norway, and they used the skin conductance. So you can see this device is placed on the, on the, uh, the, the hand of the patient. And you can see different colors, and when it turns red, it means that the patient feels nociception, and you need to treat it. Uh, the SSI SPI is mostly used in Europe, in Germany, and uh, GE also developed it uh, many years ago, 2007, more than 10 years ago. And it's using the platysmography on your fingertip, so it's like your SpO2, but it's a, a specific algorithm that analyzes the uh, platysmography from the finger. More recently, 2010, came out on the market in Europe, and now it's available in Canada also, but not yet in the US, but in Canada, uh, the analgesic index, ANI. <clears throat> it's based on the heart rate variability, HRV. You can see the EKG right here, and it takes between the two R peaks, so you have a variability of this these part of the EKG, and it does analyze this variability of the RR segment. Our eye cannot see that variability on the EKG, but the machine can see it. And based on this variability, if there is a lot of variability, you will have more pain and you will have more, uh, a higher index. And there is a new one that is just out in 2017 in uh, Europe and in Canada. It's the null index for nociception level. Uh, <coughs> it is the only one that is based on an analysis of multiple parameters. And that is important because, to me, it might be a little bit more robust than the other ones because it has many parameters analyzed and it has some uh, artificial intelligence that analyzes all these five uh, components and parameters, heart rate, variation of heart rate, skin conductance, variation of skin conductance, amplitude of the platysmography. So it, they took all the previous ones and they put them all together and with an artificial intelligence algorithm that they developed this new monitor to tell us whether or not the patient feels nociception intraoperatively. This is my OR. The null index looks like this. It's a finger probe. It gives you an index from zero, no pain, to 100, high nociception. Um, so this is the null index here, this is the ANI index and the BIS index that you know of and that uh, Draeger machine that we use in Mayor. So it's something that we can simply use and we use daily in our practice in my OR at Mon uh, Montreal University. Uh, important thing is before you use it or before you recommend to use it, we needed to do validation studies. We needed to make sure that, yes, it does detect pain or nociception, and it doesn't detect something different or something else. So we are going to take the example of the null, the most recent ones. <clears throat> this study comes from the Netherlands, and it was published in anesthesiology in December 2015. They compared the null reaction, so the reaction to nociception, uh, after intubation, after incision, and non-noxious stimulus. They compared it to heart rate, to beast index, to the blood pressure, and the null index. And as you can see, when we validate these tools or these devices, we try to build this kind of rock curve for sensitivity and one minus specificity. And if you are on that line, the diagonal line, this line, it means that your device is really bad and very, very poor sensitivity and poor specificity. If you are like this, it's that your device is super sensitive and super specific to detect nociception. The null is the blue one here, and as you can see, compared to the blood pressure in green and the heart rate in red, it 
has a better sensitivity and a better specificity than the two clinical parameters we use, clinically speaking, uh, in our daily practice. And again, they showed null or delta null versus delta heart rate and delta MAP. They have a much higher sensitivity and a much higher specificity to detect a nociceptive event or no noxious stimulus during uh, anesthesia in, in a patient. Another one came from Israel and, and USA, published again in Anesthesiology in 2016. Again, the null in red here is better than the classical clinical monitoring that are parameters that we use. Uh, again, sensitivity is much higher with the null to detect nociception. It's again a validation study. We did two studies in Montreal at my university, and they were just published in the Canadian Journal of Anesthesia in February 2019 for the last one. This is the reactivity of the null at T0, so it's before the noxious stimulus. It's tetanic stimulation at the forearm of the patient. So we have basal values between 5 and 10, and when you apply the stimulation under general anesthesia in your patients, you have some kind of increase of the null. With very low dose of remifentanil, you can see a nice increase, and if you increase the dose of remifentanil, you have a lower increase, and if you again increase more the remifentanil infusion, you have no more increase. So it's a way to validate the device and the tool, uh, and that's the reactivity to intubation, and that's the reactivity to incision. No reactivity to incision because they had a good epidural working, so it's also a nice way to test your epidural uh, and to make sure that it works well. We built these rock curves, and again, it overpassed the two clinical parameters, heart rate and, and blood pressure, so yes, we have now as a conclusion for these validation studies, these monitors, at least the two most recent ones, ANI and NOL, were validated and they are validated tools to be used in clinical practice. So they detect nociception and they detect nociception better than heart rate and better than blood pressure. It's nice to detect blood pressure, to detect pain nociception during the surgery, sorry, but it's also important to know whether or not it has an impact and it has a usefulness intraoperatively, and it will change the outcome for my patients. So does it? Uh, if we look at this study, it came out in 2017. It was using the pupil diameter, so the device I showed you on the pupil diameter, and they uh, evaluated 64 patients, adult patients, and they showed that in the group where they used, for, which, for, for whom they used, uh, the intraoperative monitoring, they could reduce intraoperative opioid need or op uh, intraoperative opioid administration, and they could also reduce postoperative morphine consumption. So by just monitoring the nociception and ad personalizing the administration of opioids intraoperatively, they could reduce intraop need of opioids and intraop need of morphine after the surgery. They showed by this graph, and you can see the pupillometer, those who were uh, followed by the pupillometry, they are in the group with a low consumption of uh, intraoperative remifentanil, and they made a relationship between low dose of remifentanil and uh, low dose morphine, and more remifentanil drop and more post-op morphine. So they changed the outcome of the patient after the surgery, at least for uh, two days after the surgery. The ANI, the, the other device, the orange one that you could see uh, previously, this one uh, was published in Anesthesia and Analgesia in 2017. They looked at back surgery patients and they analyzed the uh, need of opioids uh, and the boluses of fentanyl administration during back surgery when they used or when they didn't use a monitor to guide the administration of the opioids. Uh, in the group with the ANI monitoring, they had lower, significantly lower consumption of opioids compared to the control group who was not monitored with the ANI. And as a consequence of this monitoring, in the PACU, in the recovery room, they could show that the control group had higher, cons uh, higher pain levels and higher consumption of opioids after the surgery in the PACU meaning that by using the ANI monitoring intraoperatively to better administer 
the opioids, they could reduce pain scores and reduce opioid consumption in the PACU. This one is online <clears throat> in Anesthesiology 2019, comes from Netherlands, the same group that validated the null from Netherlands. They uh, evaluated again the null index to guide remifentanil administration during surgery uh, uh, versus no null index. And they showed that uh, patients who were uh, monitored with the null index had a lower average remifentanil consumption intraoperatively. So you can see here, monitored versus not monitored. So it's a significantly decrease in opioid administration intraoperatively. Surprisingly, they didn't have an impact on morphine consumption. They didn't have an impact on pain after surgery in that study compared to the other ones. Uh, but interestingly, they had a better, they had less hypotensive events. They had a better hemodynamic profile during the surgery because they better titrated the opioid administration and they had less effect uh, on the hemodynamic uh, during the surgery, which is also important to our patient. In our center, we did this cinnamon trial. I know that cinnamon doesn't spell like this, but it's, um, it's the acronym for what you see in red. <clears throat> we used, we decided not to use only the null index, but we decided to compare two groups. Uh, one group was monitored for depth of anesthesia and depth of analgesia, and one group was just standard of care without the BIS index and without the null index. So the purpose of that study, it's a pilot study. We wanted to see if we could see trends to design future bigger studies. So we evaluated 60 subjects. Uh, half of them were monitored with the BIS and the null index, and half of them didn't get this kind of monitoring. We placed the monitor in the control group, but we masked the monitor, so we didn't see the index intraoperatively. Uh, we wanted to show that there is a decrease in intraoperative opioids. We wanted to show that there is a decrease in intraoperative opioids, uh, an increase in anesthesia sa safety with a better hemodynamic profile and an increase in rehabilitation, post-op rehabilitation. So monitor group had BIS and null. The control group had no BIS, no null. And we based the administration of opioids and anesthetics on the MAC and on the delta of the blood pressure. We included uh, 30 patients. Uh, it's been uh, proposed, it's been presented at the ASA and the CAS meetings, and it's going to be uh, submitted soon. We um, showed that by using the two monitors and by personalizing the administration of anesthesia and analgesia intraoperatively, we could reduce the doses of desferrin administration, which is not surprising using the BIS. Uh, we didn't show any difference in terms of intraoperative opioid uh, administration because in the group that received, uh, that was monitored, we decreased the administration of desflurane to such a small amount that we at one point needed to give a little bit more opioids to, to balance anesthesia. What was the impact we had on postoperative outcomes? We had a shorter time for extubation. You can see here that uh, in blue is the control group and in, red, in orange is the <clears throat> monitored group. We, can short, we could shorten the extubation time from eight to four minutes and all our patients were extubated in the operating room, meaning that if you have four minutes less for extubation, it's meaningful for an OR turnover. Uh, the extubation time was uh, also better. Oops, sorry. In terms of uh, PACU analgesia, we had less pain at 90 minutes, but not for the early period in PACU. So surprisingly, we didn't see uh, the difference as some studies pointed out uh, previously. Uh, and we didn't see any difference, significant difference in terms of hydromorphone analgesia uh, administered in PACU. So as you can see here, there is a trend, but but there is no significant difference because it was, we didn't have, we had only 60 patients and we, we were just doing a pilot study to, to look for trends. This chart from PACU, it's not significant, but it seems to be more interesting when you got the two monitors by using depth of anesthesia, depth of analgesia monitors, BIS and null, 
we had a shorter time stay in PACU, 32 minutes versus 43 minutes at the mean. And the time to reach Aldred scores was also a decrease. And uh, the percentage of patients who were ready to leave the PACU at 30 minutes was much higher in, in the monitored group versus the control group, but it was not significant. Interestingly, we also followed up on our patients and we looked at postoperative cognitive dysfunction uh, using the MOCA, uh, which is a score for cognitive functions that we uh, evaluated before the surgery and after the surgery, and we used two, a decrease of two standard deviations after the surgery as a surrogate of positive postoperative cognitive dysfunction. And we showed that in the control group, <clears throat> no monitoring, about 18% of the population had a decrease of more than two standard deviation in the cognitive function, whereas it's only less than 5% in the monitor group. So by monitoring our patients, the quality of postoperative recovery seems to be better also on postoperative uh, uh, cognitive dysfunction. So at the conclusion, we have new intraoperative monitors uh, available in Canada, available in Europe, they will, they, and they will be soon available in the US. I know that the companies are working uh, with the FDA to get the approval. Uh, they are validated to detect nociception intraoperatively, so it's, it's validated and it's not just for fun that we are using them. Uh, their use can help titrating and decrease the need of intraoperative opioids. Uh, as a consequence of their use, we can hope that we will decrease the pain scores, decrease, decrease the early opioid requirement after surgery. Uh, we have nothing on the long-term effect on persistent pain after surgery. We do not know if it will change this outcome, but we need to do bigger studies on that. Um, they have some cost, so for sure if you add a monitor in your OR, you will not pay for the monitor, but you will pay for the supplies because they come with supplies and you will need to buy the supplies and you will need to justify to your administration why you want to use these supplies and pay $30 each per patient uh, in order to improve postoperative outcomes. So you will have to demonstrate that to, uh, to your administration. Uh, and their impact on postoperative morbidity and early and long-term outcomes must be better studied in fut future on large-scale multicentric clinical trials. So we are still missing these big studies. We are working on it, but uh, we will need to show that there is an impact not only on nociception, because it's nice to monitor nociception, but it's also nice to show that it has an impact in terms of quality of recovery. And as Patricia was saying, we have scores to evaluate quality of recovery after surgery, like QR15, QR40. So we have many scores and many ways of evaluating satisfaction and quality of recovery. So whether or not it will change this recovery has to be proven. Thank you. <clears throat> so I will invite uh, Professor Angst and Professor Lavendam to come to the stage. If you have questions, uh, you have microphones, so please go to the microphones so everybody can hear you, and uh, we will be happy to take all the questions you have on the free topics and the free uh, lectures. <clears throat> Thank you for a fantastic talk. Um, this is extremely topical. Everybody is trying to reduce our <coughs> opioid consumption now. So my question is for Dr. Angst primarily about you, the use of uh, adjunctives like ketamine, for example. And you know, when would you use it in terms of timing? Do you use it or, or what method of um, administration? Like, would you give it as a bolus uh, or as a continuous infusion for a long case? No, thank you for the question. Uh, I think the, the studies that have uh, convincingly shown that it's uh, preemptive or prevents opioid induced hyperalgesia tolerance uh, use infusions, that doesn't mean that bolusing doesn't work, but based on the evidence, the infusion, and uh, typically it's like uh, half a milligram per kilogram as a bolus and then um, a quarter milligram per kilogram per hour as an infusion, and then you can in stop the infusion typically 30 minutes before emergence so that patients will wake up. 
Yeah, Dr. Blais Montreal, I have a question for each of us, of you. Uh, you saw that ketamine is very efficient to prevent or to treat uh, opioid induced hyperalgesia. What about the other medication like alpha 2 agonists, uh, like gabapentin, like ultra low dose naloxone, like cannabis maybe? I don't know. What about this medication? Yeah, many of these have been discussed. Uh, I think most convincing evidence exists for ketamine. Um, that doesn't mean that other medications uh, couldn't work. There is some animal evidence, but just clinically, we know most about ketamine. Um, I've mentioned uh, peripheral mu antagonists. That's currently a big interest, has to be studied. We don't know if uh, methyl naltrexone could actually be used. Uh, with respect to esmolol, that has been suggested that esmolol could be effective. We have uh, about data on about 700 patients with respect to esmolol reviewed in a recent meta-analysis. And we are not quite sure, but it is possible. So I'm a pragmatist, and so uh, in the absence of, you know, serious side effects, I use what we know works, but by all means, you know, it's absolutely possible that other medications may be effective as well. If uh, you agree, I have a question for Patricia. Uh, you, very nice presentation. What about if you use anesthesia without opioid, uh, with zero opioid, what's the effect on the recurrence of cancer? Thank you, Gilbert. This is a good question, but cancer, this is really complicated. It's like no. chronic pain after <laughs> surgery. And I'm not sure that only opioid-free, so no opioid during the short period of the surgical procedure may have an impact on the cancer recurrence. Uh, it's really difficult, has not been proved in patients. I think it's almost impossible to prove that. So cancer, I will be very cautious. But uh, we have animal study, and perhaps in the future we will see something, but I'm not sure it will be possible to, to find something about the cancer because immunity, and Professor Angst know that is very complicated, and no period of sh short period because in cancer patients, you have the surgery, but you have also all the treatment that the patient receives after the procedure, uh, which have an impact on the recurrence of the cancer. Um, you have the big stress response to this treatment after surgery in patient, and all these things have an impact on the cancer recurrence and the, and the immunity of the patient. So I'm not sure. Intraoperative, no opioid uh, could impact this. No. So there was a, uh, I think there was a session yesterday, um, if I'm not mistaken about it, and um, I agree, it's, it's complicated. So I think it's a really interesting question. It's an important question. If you look at different models, uh, you take cell-based models, you take uh, mouse models, rat models, you take specific cancer cell lines. Um, I think it is fair to state that outcomes uh, are different. What you can show in a cell line, you may not be able to show in an animal and vice versa. It depends on the cancer cell line. And one of the conclusions at that meeting uh, was that cancer is not cancer. Cancer biology is complicated. Um, and then we probably, so we, we, we cannot just lump sum it. So it's a question that has to be studied. I think the notion that opiates are necessarily bad and propagate cancer and, you know, favor micrometastases is a little bit uh, foredrawn at this point in time. Mm -hmm. I also think that we need to be mindful of the doses that we'll use. And sort of the theme that I feel most comfortable with at this point is just to say we should be conservative. In my days as a resident, you know, we pushed a lot of fentanyl under the idea, with the idea that we would do good, preempt analgesia, or, uh, and, and I can tell you that uh, my pushes of fentanyl have shrinked considerably over my time as an anesthesiologist. Yeah, and, and, and there are, we are doing studies on that topic on cancer after surgery, and, and it's true that opioids might increase the risk of recurrence, but, but the surgery itself and the inflammation and all these things are also a good factor for in, in increasing the risk of recurrence. So it's not only opioids, but as I agree with you that yeah. we have to decrease the doses as much as we can because we know that they might have an impact 
from animal studies. We don't really know in humans. But. Yeah, I think the really interesting question is, you know, if you think about competing immune interests, mm -hmm. So cancer surveillance as an immune interest and response to trauma as an immune interest may not be in sync. So for example, uh, as a result of surgery, you will suppress some, many of the adaptive immune mechanisms, which is meaningful to prevent recognition of self as foreign. But if you, uh, uh, at that same point, you may actually, that's a meaningful response to surgery that may actually interfere with the interests of cancer surveillance mechanisms. But, so it's an important question, but uh, I don't, don't think we know the answer to that. Thank you. Thank you. Sharon Orbeck Singer from Israel. It was amazing lectures. Um, I was wondering about neuroaxial op opioids. You talked about systemic opioids, but is the verdict a little bit different with intrathecal or epidural morphine? Um, and the next question is, do you have any information on the obstetric population? Is it a little bit different than the other populations? I, to you or to me? Yeah, please. Or to who I have else? spoken a lot. Okay. So I, <laughs> regarding the intrathecal versus intravenous or versus, versus epidural administration of opioids, there are studies, first in animal studies, uh, we have done a lot of animal studies with intrathecal opioids versus IV opioids showing that the two routes induce the same type of hyperalgesia. So if you give high doses of opioids, fentanyl for instance, if you give high doses of fentanyl intraoperatively uh, to a rat or to a patient, uh, you will see a higher risk of hypersensitivity. So it does exist even with morphine IT. So it's been shown that IT morphine can also induce high doses, can also induce this kind of hyperalgesia induced by opioids if we believe in it. But, but yes, in C-sections, and if you look at these meta-analyses on uh, opioid-induced hyperalgesia, does it exist? Based on clinical studies, uh, it shows that uh, I would say one-third of the studies from the meta-analyses come from C-sections. And they said fentanyl high doses induces more hyperalgesia than fentanyl low doses or no fentanyl. So yes, it does even if you give it intrathecally, it does induce this opioid-induced hypersensitivity or tolerance. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your great uh, lectures. I'm Axel and I'm a sociologist from Stockholm, Sweden. I have uh, two short questions on the same narrow part of a topic. Uh, it's concerning the um, dose-related rela dose um, change in uh, BIS-EEG when you're using ketamine for opioid-free anesthesia. And the first question is if you know of any BIS uh, apparatus that has come around this, um, I mean, the situation where the machine reads it, the, the situation as if the anesthesia is quite light where it is actually quite deep. Um, and the qu second question is if you have some other technique or, or a workaround in, in your clinical practice when you're doing OFA? Uh, you mean uh, the monitoring for yeah. OFA? Yeah, yes. and then specifically the EEG-based yeah. uh, nociceptive devices. I, I can answer like this. one because yes, we, we have just completed one study in Montreal uh, looking at this impact on ketamine doses, low-dose ketamine. We are not using anesthetic doses. We are talking here about low-dose ketamine. Low-dose ketamine means a bolus of 0 0.25, 0 0.5 milligram per kilogram, and then an infusion during the surgery with very low dose of ketamine versus bolus during the, uh, during the, um, the, the anesthesia. There are people who don't want to run an infusion, so they prefer to give boluses every hour. They give one small bolus of ketamine to the patient, which I agree with because uh, you don't always have pumps to give all your infusion and your pumps are already busy with infusing, infusing other things. So whether ketamine boluses versus ketamine infusion changes the EEG monitoring, yes it does. The study we just completed shows that if you give boluses every hour, you will see a change more than 15% of increase in the BIS index for about 10 to 15 minutes. It takes 10 to 15 minutes to go back to its normal value. So it means that you need to be careful because what happened in, in the study we did, because we didn't want to keep the beast so high, we increased the death fluorine. So what happens is that in, it overdoses the patient for a while, for 10, 15 minutes, 
and the consequence of overdosing anesthesia is have a decrease in blood pressure and need of more vasopressor. So it's one of the conclusions of that study that will be if you use ketamine boluses instead of infusion, because we didn't see that with the infusion, mm -hmm. but we saw that with the bolus administration. So if you use bolus administration every hour, be careful. You need to know that your base is going to go up for five, ten minutes, and then it goes down again. So you just need to be aware of that and don't turn on or don't increase your gas because it doesn't mean that your patient is waking up. It's just your base index that is changing. And your dose for continuous infusion is around five micrograms per... Uh, it's between two minutes. and five mics per oh. kilo per minute. Yeah. Thank you very much. General Manic, University of Vermont. Um, for Dr. Fletcher, um, have you studied with the null monitor? Have you studied differences uh, between sevoflurane and desflurane and enflurane um, as far as no susception? It's a very interesting question. We are doing one study. There are literature and uh, out uh, in anesthesia now uh, on the difference uh, or the impact of gases or propofol on, an or on the anti-nociception effect. Do they have the same anti-nociception anti effect or do they really have any anti-nociception effect or analgesic effect? Uh, it's true that there are some literature in animals showing that propofol might be more analgesic than sevoflurane or desflurane. Um, we are doing studies now what, looking at that in humans and looking at an experimental design because it's a little bit difficult to, to look at that in humans. So we need to look at specific noxious stimulus uh, and to see if propofol is better than sevoflurane, better than desflurane. So that's something we are analyzing now, but uh, we cannot say now based on the literature existing that one is better than the other. So it's, um, Thank you. Hey, one question for Dr. Levon Holm. Um, NSAIDs are kind of a base, and it's frustrating the number of people that, for one reason or another, are either not supposed to have them or the surgery, surgeons don't want them. Do you separate out different NSAIDs that are safer, or, or you know, do you have an algorithm that you go through to kind of use, if you can't use Ketorolac, you could use Advil or, you know, do you, do you go through any sort of differentiation between the different NSAIDs at all, Celebrex? No, in uh, a lot of our patients, I'm working in orthopedic procedure, and uh, it's a hand and recovery for knee and hip, and they, they receive uh, the COX-2 selective inhibitors, uh, selecoxib, oral selecoxib, and oral uh, acetaminophen before the procedure, and a dose of uh, gabapentin And uh, I... Also, in, for postoperative treatment, we use ibuprofen. In other patients, I think there is, is no big deal about the difference in the, in the NSAID for opioid-free anesthesia. But it's, it's, a, it's a good base. I think acetaminophen and NSAID is, uh, is the base for postoperative uh, pain management. Hi, uh, Brad Fritz from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, I had a question about the nociception monitors. Mm -hmm. And in particular, I was wondering if any of the studies have included patients with traumatic brain injury. Um, I'm, a, I, I'm an ICU medicine fellow, so I see a lot of those patients. And it's, they often have reasons to have pain, but aren't able to communicate that. Mm -hmm. But it also seems like some of the signals that those monitors are looking for might be different in that population. So we have uh, performed two studies in ICU so far. They are not published yet. They have been presented at uh, intensive care medicine uh, meetings, but we haven't published the, the studies that are submitted now. Uh, so we looked at uh, ICU after cardiac surgery, and we look at ICU general care. Um, and, and we showed that uh, we have one uh, PhD in Montreal, uh, Dr. Gelinas. She's a PhD, and she looks at uh, pain in ICU, and she's published a lot of things, and she has developed one score that is called the CPOT score uh, in, um, in ICU to evaluate pain in non-communicating patients. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we have correlated the null index to the CPOT, uh, and there is a very high correlation between the two uh, indexes or the two uh, scores. So it's interesting to see that this score, this index, is able to match what the CPOT score says. Uh, in non-communicating patients. So it's a start in, we are just starting studying this in ICU, but it might be interesting in that population. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, 
TJ Gant from um, Stony Brook, <coughs> New York. I uh, enjoyed the presentation. So my question is um, <coughs> probably more directed at uh, Professor Rishabian, but I'd like to hear the panel's response. Um, with regards to the nociceptive monitor, I believe that we are still in a very sort of infancy stage trying to see what is the best monitor. Now, I think there are obviously a number of different um, uh, technology, you know, as you presented, some using pupillometry, others using uh, more skin conductance to assess autonom autonomic response. And they're also using EEG to trying to, uh, the QNOX mm. and QCOM to trying to assess. Yeah. I guess my question is that, you know, <clears throat> we are using autonomic response, or I guess no autonomic response is a surrogate for nociceptive response, and it yeah. may not be entirely all the nociceptive response may be totally separate. Mm -hmm. Question is whether, what, what do you think that in, in terms of the evolution of the technology, would it be better to incorporate the different technology, you know, the EEG, the, the uh, uh, variability, the pupillometry, to come into one? Does that improve the uh, accuracy of the, uh, of the index? And where do you see this <clears throat> going in the future? Because <clears throat> Obviously, they're all different companies' technology, so it's very unlikely they're going to share technology. But I, I think that you know, it's one of those things that unless you get all the uh, different aspects together uh, and before you can get really a good clinical, useful monitor to uh, you know, use in a clinical environment. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, for the last 15 years, we have seen a big evolution in these monitors. Uh, 15 years or 20 years ago, only the pupillometer was existing. We didn't have anything else. And I, it's not that I don't like the pupillometer, but I, I think that it's not very adapted to my clinical practice uh, because intraoperatively you need to open the eye of the patient, you need to check, and it's not a continuous monitoring. It's just a, a monitor that you evaluate every 5-10 minutes and doesn't give me much of information. I prefer to use continuous monitoring. So the continuous monitoring that came on the market where first the skin conductance. Problem with the skin conductance that I see in my clinical practice is that if you use the skin conductance alone, it has a lot of interferences coming from the environment of the operating room. Electrical interferences from the electrocutary or lots of things that will change the skin conductance. So alone, don't think it's a very good one, uh, but it's just my opinion, but, uh, and I'm just giving you my opinion. It's not based on, uh, on literature or whatever, but it's based on my clinical practice and the use of these devices for the last 15 years. Um, in terms of um, next ones coming on the market, the ANI, the heart rate variability alone, Again, it's a nice monitor. It does detect pain. When you do experimental studies, it does detect the nociception that you inflict to the patient. So yes, it's a good monitor to detect it. Whether or not it's useful intraoperatively, again, it has some problems with electricity and electrocutary and all the things, the electrical things which are going to change the EKG. You know, when they are working in the thorax or next to the the electrodes, it interferes with my EKG, and then when I lose my EKG, I lose my signal. So it's, it also has limits. Uh, the SPI has limits with the position of the patient, the, the volemia of the patient, the fluid that you give to the patient, so it, it has some limitations too. And the last one, the null one, is a multiparametric uh, association of many parameters that were used previously. So by using these multiparametric approach and by using these artificial intelligence algorithm that we have nowadays that we didn't have 10 years ago, combining all these things together, to me, in my clinical practice, it seems more robust than the other ones. Where are we going to go? Because the null also has some limits. If I give, and Patricia was talking about beta blockers to mask pain or to, to mask the increase in heart rate and so you you might have, in the meta-analysis with beta blockers, you might have an impact on postoperative pain, acute pain, and uh, opioid consumption if you use intraoperative beta blockers. But if you use intraoperative beta blockers, your null index is going to go down to zero and you don't see anything anymore. So it's, it has limits. Like all the devices we use, they have limits. Uh, 
I, if I had to make a choice in what would be the best in the future, I think that I would love to have some kind of recording of my sensory pathways, you know, like putting an electrode next to my nerves and looking at the signal that goes from the periphery to the brain, but it doesn't exist yet. So it's, um, that would be the best thing to do, I think, to, if you do a surgery on the knee, if you can target the nerve going from the knee to the spine and look at the activity of this nerve, that would be the wonderful device uh, that will win the competition, but we don't have that uh, available now. So we just have to look at the balance between the autonomic, in the autonomic system. So it's, um, we need to be, I agree with you, we need to be aware that they are useful, but they also have limits. So you need to keep using your brain and say, okay, does it really work well with what I see on my screen? And if everything works, then it can be a help to your decision. Do you have any thoughts on the EEG basic? I didn't hear you talk about <clears throat> that. I know that there are, uh, there are devices that combine the EEG and, uh, and uh, also some kind of uh, autonomic system uh, balance uh, parameters, but, but there are, I haven't used these monitors myself, so I cannot give you my opinion on that, but in terms of uh, Pract uh, literature, it seems that they, they might be interesting also. But it might be a nice thing to associate that. Uh, to go back to the EEG monitors, when you look at the studies on the monitors, the validation of the null index, the validation of the ANI, or the validation of all these things, they always compared it, the null index, they always compared the null index to the BIS index, the EEG monitor that is the more classically used in ORs. Uh, and the BIS index, if I inflict some pain or noxious stimulus to my patients, the BIS index does change. But if you do these sensitivity and specificity rock curves, uh, it is not as sensitive as the null index to detect the noxious stimulus. So yes, the BIS index might be interesting, but it's really not as good as the null to detect the, sens the, the, the pain. Thank you. Thank you. Claudia Coimbra from Canada. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, all three of you with uh, excellent uh, presentations. My question goes, someone asked a little bit about uh, intrathecal epidural opioids and I heard the response, but I was wondering, did you change uh, your habits for the post-operative epidural for analgesia where we use, uh, we normally put uh, in uh, some kind of little dose of narcotics to mm -hmm. usually to decrease the local anesthetics, but did you guys start changing that also in your practice? No, I think uh, we use first very low dose of narcotics in the epidural, <coughs> but if you don't add narcotics to your epidural, uh, it's not working so well. Mm -hmm. So uh, the goal is to provide to patient a very good postoperative analgesia. What we do, uh, we often we combine a very small dose of narcotic with uh, alpha-2 adrenergic agonist with clonidine into the epidural. Okay. Sometimes we do only a local anesthetic with, uh, with clonidine, with no narcotic. It depends, but yes, I think we we need to be ethic and to have a functioning uh, epidural for all patients after the procedure. So, Dr. Rishbe, since you're in Canada, clonidine in the epidurals, which we don't... We, we, we don't use it, no. for sure. Um, whether or not we should uh, <laughs> is yeah, a good question. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have that. <laughs> But we don't, we, it's not, I mean, it's not uh, approved and it's not available uh, and it's not approved by Health Canada, so it's um, for its use, for this use. So it's, I would say, you know, we can always work outside of the, <laughs> of what is uh, recommended, but I, I, for Canadians, I would recommend not to use it, but uh, it's uh, just for, because so, of the regulation in Canada, but it's. Uh, okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Ruth Landau from Colombia. I want to thank you for super presentations and for allowing us to see how complicated things can be demonstrated in simple and accessible ways. I have a question for the three of you. Um, we see the history of anesthesia, and Patricia showed us a few slides on that, is that the pendulum swings. So we've been 
you know, probably under treating pain mm -hmm. to potentially over treating pain or trying to over treat pain with a massive amount of opioids that has resulted in the opioid crisis that we are trying to uh, curb in North America. I am worried that with the opioid free anesthesia sort of logo and concept, we're going to be sort of swinging, the pendulum will swing back. And I'm already seeing it and it's in interesting. We see in, in, in the United States that CRNAs are very fond of it and there's a movement towards opioid free anesthesia. So my question to you is what are going to be the tools, the messages, the information, the education to finally do what probably is more complicated than giving a lot of opioids or no opioids, and you've talked about uh, you know, balanced opioid anesthesia or low-dose opioid anesthesia. I'm asking you as the leaders in the field, how do you think to best message that it might require a little bit more uh, tailoring and balancing things and that the Goldilocks phenomenon will also apply here where just right will be better than none or too much? Okay, I'm gonna start. <laughs> I would just add to the, to the comment or the question, just add something that you may answer the two of you. Because um, <clears throat> when we do opioid-free anesthesia, it means that we use something else than opioids because we, as you say, for ethical reasons, we need to give something and we need to treat pain. So if you don't give opioids, you need to give something else. So we use regional anesthesia number one, Everybody agrees on that. But if we do not cover everything, we need to give something. And if we give something, we give dexmedidomidine, we give ketamine, we give IV lidocaine, we give gabapentinoids, we give this and this and this. At the end, the patient takes a lot of medications. A lot of medications means also a lot of side effects. And that's a question that is very important because we have published recently a paper on using dexmethidomidine versus remifentanil for EBUS. So it's uh, some kind of uh, outside uh, anesthesia things that we do in, uh, in pneumology. But by using dexmethidomidine, the patients who received dexmethidomidine, they stayed in PACU for 100% times more than the patient who received remifentanil because they had a delayed recovery. So by using all these adjuvants that we say, yes, we have a target for ketamine, we have a target for nitrous oxide, we have a target for magnesium, we have a target for heavy lidocaine, we know where they work. Beta blockers, I don't agree with that because I don't know where they work, but still, <laughs> still some people use it. But we have, for all these adjuvants, we have targets, and we know that they might target something, but they come with side effects, and when you combine all of them, the take-home message must be you know, we, we need to be careful of what we do, so I will let you speak about that. Yes, just a word. Uh, and it, it's a question, it's the recipe of opioid-free anesthesia. I, you need first to know very well anesthesia and patient reaction. So I began in the past, I was teach with the opioid low dose, because always in my institution we were using clonidine and uh, ketamine. So we use very low dose of uh, intraoperative opioid, and the dose was so low that finally I told and I said to myself, why to give 2.5 micrograms to fentanyl to a patient? I don't need it. But this is really true. We need more study about the side effect of all the combination of the drug that we use during the surgery, but also after the surgery. For postoperative uh, analgesia, uh, some people use a lot of combination. And in the publication, there is not of a report about the side effect of the combination. So if you want to use opioid-free anesthesia, uh, when I use it, I never put all the drugs together for the patient, because if that, uh, you cannot wake up the patient uh, in time, the patient will feel dizzy, and you, have, uh, you will have a counterproductive effect. And to, to come to your question, Ruth, I think we need to be careful. Opioid-free, I do opioid-free anesthesia during the surgery. But for postoperative pain, I use opioid. And the drug I use for opioid-free during the surgery have opioid sparing effect on the postoperative period. This is the, the most important. It's not the, the 2.5 micrograms of fentanyl I don't give to my patient. I'm not sure it makes a difference, perhaps for the nausea and vomiting. But for other things, I'm not sure. But the drug, the other drug I use, I don't, IV lidocaine, very potent anti-inflammatory drug, modulin, 
uh, modulate uh, immunity, uh, ketamine also is anti-inflammatory. Uh, all these drugs can have an impact on postoperative pain. And postoperative pain and the use of postoperative opioid, as I said in my, uh, in my lecture, this is a matter of education. So doing opioid free doesn't mean that you will let your patient in pain crying after the procedure. We need to, be, to, to stay ethical. But opioid free, I think, could be a trigger about uh, education for the, the medical uh, health, um, health provider. I just want to make one more comment. I think the problem with opioid-free anesthesia is that people are misunderstanding mm -hmm. it as a yeah. solution for the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. So you described it very well. There's the intraoperative period, yeah. there's the postoperative, and then the prescription, which obviously was not the topic of today's panel. But if people are thinking that the opioid-free anesthesia is going to curb the opioid mm -hmm. epidemic, we're in deep trouble because you've just mentioned it again. You're not giving it intraop, but you are giving it post-op. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious to know what Martin is going to do. <laughs> Well, I mean, I said I'm a pragmatist, and um, I typically, uh, maybe with the exception of the field of oncology, uh, think we should avoid the extremes. Um, I think oncology is the only field where I know that virtually killing biology actually helps patients. So within anesthesia, within, uh, you know, post-op pain management um, and intra pain management or anti nociceptive management, I have never been convinced that going very high or avoiding it at all actually is um, how biology works and how pharmacology works. And I'm a little bit anxious if you use these labels that we come across as radical and we actually don't really help the cause, which I think is don't use narcotics liberally. I don't think there's any advantage of using high doses. And I think that's sort of the most important message. Um, I also think when I teach residents that there are sort of two moments in anesthesia. One is uh, patients anesthetized, and we're really dealing with uh, a lot of cardiovascular issues, but then we transition a pain to consciousness, and that's when suffering and pain actually occur. So I try to sort of teach them there's really no benefit of giving narcotics in TROP if you don't have to for control of cardiovascular parameters. But that objective changes as you wake your patient up and there we transition and I think uh, we give narcotics. I liked actually the pyramid that uh, you showed um, where we sort of now change maybe first line, second line, third line ideas of how we treat patients. So we give them pre-op uh, an ANSET, we give them acetaminophen and then we add narcotics as needed as opposed to start with narcotics. And I want to just one, make one more comment on the gabapentin which was extremely popular and was actually included in many ARAS protocols in our institution. Now we learn it actually may not work in most patients. We learn it increases fall risk and we learn that increases basically the risk of apnea post-op because of the use of narcotics in the post-op period. So I think as we go along, you know, we just have to be observant, we have to learn, we have to be open, we have to be educated. Uh, but I, as I, going back of what we should teach, avoid high doses and maybe switch the pyramids in how we approach things. And, and to, to finish with that comment, on that comment and the pendulum, and it's true that if you look at the history of the use of opioids in anesthesia, during, the, during general anesthesia, we, when I trained, I started my residency in 1995, at that time, people said, oh, don't give opioids, it's bad for the patient, so they tended to avoid. And then in 2000, 2005, we gave many, many opioids, or too much opioids, and that's when we started to see in animals, but also in humans, that high doses of opioids are bad for the patients. And now the pendulum goes down to low doses of opioids. So if we don't want to go to opioid free, free, free anesthesia, we can go to opioid low dose anesthesia, which I think is the take home message to, to, to go with today, because it's, uh, we cannot avoid 100% opioids in our practice, but we need to precisely administer them. And that's why I wanted to talk about these monitors of, an, of analgesia or nociception in order to precisely give the right dose at the right time to the right patient and not to overdose my patients intraoperatively. Thank you. Merci beaucoup for your, atten for your attention. For